Thank you very much, Bridget. Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to have you here with us today. Uh, we're thrilled to have Tara and Sami here. Sami is joining us from his home on a stunning hilltop in Umbria in Italy, and Tara is a little closer in southwest London. They need no introduction, but for those of you who are here to get to know them better, Sami Tamimi is a chef and author born in Jerusalem. He was one of the business partners that founded Ottolenghi, one of Britain's most beloved culinary enterprises. For 20 years, he's also been head chef there, and we can all agree that the food he created had a transformative impact on the UK culinary scene, bringing a food concept that looks and tastes like sunshine, much needed in a place where we don't normally get enough sunshine. From just one deli in Notting Hill, they now run several delis and restaurants and have published, I think, nine cookbooks. Sami has also been at the helm of the Ottolenghi Kitchens as a head chef for almost 20 years and has co-authored three books, the first Ottolenghi cookbook and then Jerusalem and most recently, Palestine. Tara Wigley is a writer and a cook. She's been part of the Ottolenghi family, developing, testing and writing recipes and columns for The Guardian and The New York Times, amongst other publications for 10 years. She was involved in writing at least cookbooks and is the co-author of two, Simple and Palestine. She's also recently taking to writing the most extraordinary food ditties, <laughs> which I advise you all to check out on Instagram and has run the Palestine Marathon in Bethlehem. As for Palestine, we've been waiting for this book with so much anticipation particularly as publication day neared and we were meant to do a few launch events together and supper clubs. As luck would have it, the book launch date happened to coincide with the start of lockdown back in March, 2020. But despite the fact that the book tour that was envisioned didn't happen, there was no stopping the success of Palestine. Our customers all love it and we can't top up our stocks fast enough. 18 months later, here we all are celebrating the cookery book of the year. Huge congratulations to you both. Thank you very much. And thank you for having us as well. It's we've, just about, we've just about got over our hangovers. So we're here and eloquent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'd love you both to introduce the book to us and tell us a bit about how the idea of writing a Palestinian cookbook evolved from something you would like to do one day to let's do this. Now is the time. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, the book, uh, I had the idea of the book for many years, but, you know, uh, as you get older, it kind of, you have to do a whole um, uh, circle. And when we were working on Jerusalem with, with your term, it kind of triggered the idea again. And I thought I would like to do this book. And, uh, but, you know, b because of work and before you know it, we open another restaurant, another deli, we kind of, I just kind of put it on the side, but it was always there kind of vividly. This is what I want to do next. And then, um, I mean, the time that I started thinking about it, the market was really not kind of into, or not ready for Palestinian cookbooks. And luckily before Palestine, there were few wonderful cookbooks like uh, Judy Callas and uh, uh, Jasmine Khan, all these people that kind of published books before us and somehow it made pave the way to to Palestine to come out and shine as it is uh, yeah we were unlucky because of the whole COVID thing but um, people were just buying the book and cooking from the book before you even buy, buying the book I, I remember uh, freaking out and started doing demos uh, in my kitchen in London and people really really bought into that and um, they were cooking from, from the book. And then when they could get the book, they just basically started um, cooking more and loving, loving the whole concept of the, 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 the book and the stories and the recipes. And yeah, since then, we, we've been kind of really, really um, pleased with how things are going. Mm. And as Sami says, like, as, well as, as well as Sami being ready, um, and thanks to the other books that kind of paved the way, we felt like the market was ready to move beyond just kind of Middle Eastern food as a kind of homogenous grouping. You know, every sort of magazine seems to be some sort of generic kind of somehow Middle Eastern food. Um, and everyone actually wanting to kind of zoom in on, well, so what's Palestinian food? And cookery books are such a, a kind of safe and welcoming 
way to kind of hold people's hand who might be a bit intimidated by maybe their lack of knowledge about the background or the history or the culture or the people or the produce. And, you know, we all have these nonfiction books sitting on our shelf, probably slightly not read. Um, and, and yet a cookbook is just a very kind of, it's sort of easy way in because you can dip, but dip in. And so as well as all, all the recipes that we have, we also have lots of words um, and tell lots of stories about the people and the place and the produce. Um, sort of profiles of people in Palestine. That's a lot of P's in one sentence, <laughs> um, which is ironic because there's no P in. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, and yeah, and people have really responded responded well to that. So both the kind of the recipes and the stories. Um, in the book, you write, Sami is the host and Tara is the guide. Uh, you both strike me as quite different personalities, but one thing reading about you two, one thing you certainly have in common, apart from your love of food, is a sense of adventure. Sami, 24 years ago, you received a job offer to come and work in London, so you just packed up your bags and, and moved countries. I, I think you didn't even speak that good English at the time. No. Uh, and you're, I sorry, go on. I, I think, uh, if anything, we are totally two different personalities. It's just kind of, uh, it started from before the, the book. And I remember Tara will probably tell you the story better than me, but Tara, before we went the first time to Palestine, she had these spreadsheets and organized and emailing everybody and freaking out that they don't answer the, the emails. and. I just remember one point we were, I think we were high fast there, dude, listen, we're in the Middle East now. <laughs> they work differently. You have, when they say tomorrow, it doesn't mean that it's gonna happen tomorrow yeah. and they don't answer emails. So they are busy milking the cows and doing cheese. And, <laughs> and, uh, and this, is, uh, this is part of it. And also uh, Tara is, um, uh, is a, a very busy mom and she's just full of energy and, uh, I'm totally the opposite. I'm just kind of a little bit more, um, what, how to call it, it's just kind of relax, take it easy and just wake up in the morning and have my coffee and go down. When I go down to have my coffee in the morning, Tara already had breakfast, swam, um, cycled, and sometimes she would run and do some work as well. So for me, this is like, you know, the beginning of the day, but for Tara, it's already like almost, you know, half of the day gone already <laughs> but you kind of you need you need both that you i'm sure as everyone knows for all projects these sort of different different personalities and also our journey uh yeah. with the food was a completely sort of opposite one so for sammy it was this journey back home it was this sort of love letter home as we say to the food and people of his youth and for me it was an adventure into a new cuisine um, so again, sort of traveling in this opposite direction was again sort of really useful for the book because it meant that there was no recipe or words or stories that we committed to without a lot of debate because we were just seeing things from very different angles. And then, and then obviously as an outsider, um, uh, I know the questions that I've got because I'm the sort of ignorant reader who wants to ask the questions that you feel a bit sort of awkward or silly to ask. Um, things that Sammy has just lived and breathed, so sort of doesn't realize that people don't know sort of X and Y. Um, so, so it worked. I mean, there was, there was, uh, you know, there was one or two moments, but uh, we are stronger, bolder, more together as a result of it and eating some, uh, something in the field there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I was saying that you, your sense of adventure, both of you have that in common, apart from your, you know, love of food as well, of course. Tara, like 10 years ago, I think, it was when your twins were 18 months old that you decided to leave your career in publishing, bundle up the toddlers and your dog to go off to uh, Ireland to retrain as a cook. So this sort of jumping off the deep end is quite familiar to for you both. Uh, in fact, I saw a picture that reminded me of that, you jumping off that wall in oh, yeah. Akka. That's actually not me. That's a, uh, that's a local boy. But I've got, that's I've got a local uh, I have boy, got, but I I've think we have me, got yeah. a picture of you jumping. No, it's a long way down. I have to okay. in Akka. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I think it's, is it 500 feet high? It was a long way. I, I have to say, I don't think these guys had seen many women launch and stuff off, but I had a, um, it's a, it's a non-related story, but when my daughter was about three years old, my husband was jumping off a 
rock or a cliff in Scotland. And I couldn't be bothered to do it that day. And then someone said, oh, Tara, why don't you do it? And Scarlett, age three or something, said, oh no, mummies don't jump. And my whole body was like, oh, this three-year-old girl thinks that mummies don't jump. So now whenever I see a rock, what I was saying when I was flying off was mummies don't jump. <laughs> so now there's this kind of obligation to jump off everything. Although the annoying <laughs> thing is, Jenny Zarens, our amazing photographer, didn't get the bloody photo first time around, so I had to do it a second time. <laughs> Amazing. And the second time around, you know what to expect, exactly. almost even worse. Um, I can just imagine looking at the faces of those boys or just at their stance that they're thinking, this crazy woman, who is she? It's amazing to think uh, the, about the, the, They were quite happy to see a woman standing there and trying to jump. I don't think they believed that uh, Tara would jump. Uh, but then when she did, they were like, oh, she's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, although I'd eaten rather a lot of the, um, that fish baked in tahini just before, so I have to say I fell down quite heavily. But um, it's amazing to think about going to the cookery school. And, and you know, I was such a fangirl of Sammy and Yotam and just kind of, just sort of apropos of taking risks and jumping. You know, the, the, um, the spirit of Doreen Allen is really, really strong and forceful and she's the one who makes you believe you can just that there's no downside to just trying to get in touch with people and reaching out and you know if someone had told me then that I'd be writing a book with Sammy kind of how many years on but it is just that sort of metaphorical or literal jumping because what's the worst that can happen amazing so Ballymaloo culinary school is the place where you get a dose of courage to just change your life and and just go for it yeah Oh, yeah. I remember that. Um, Sam, you grew up in one of the most iconic places on earth, undoubtedly, the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, you're the youngest of 12 kids, I think, and the only one who left home. No, what was it yeah, like? No, I'm family? the youngest of seven, and then my father had another five. Right. So. <laughs> uh, what was it gro like growing up there and going back after an almost 20 year absence? I mean, growing up in a, a Muslim family in, in, in the old city with so many siblings, it, it felt a bit kind of protected and too, uh, very safe. And uh, um, you kind of um, know what's going to happen to you, you know, all your life, you know, that was, you know, kind of, it's, it's almost like you kind of follow the same um, path as your siblings. But I wasn't happy with that. <laughs> I wanted to do something else. And um, I was into art, but I wanted to do something else. And cooking was kind of uh, not on the agenda. I mean, I, I was very interested in, in food since I was a kid. I used to just sneak into my mom's kitchen to see what's happening. But uh, it's only when I was a teenager that the whole cooking came, came to my life. And I'm glad it did it because it changed my life. But also it, it made me... Uh, to the, uh, determined that you know that that I need to leave that old city and just go and look for what I love but also the the, the fact that uh, um, I wasn't happy with just you know you you get a job and then you get married and you get kids and live not far from the family uh, so that and uh, um, I, I finally find something that I, I enjoy to do which is almost like painting um, I didn't earn a lot of money then, but you know, I, it took years and I wanted to learn as much. So I moved from one place to another uh, around Jerusalem. And then um, I moved to Tel Aviv and from Tel Aviv to London. And yeah, the, the rest of the story is kind of known to Amazing. Us. Well, we're glad that you found that love for cooking. You certainly also changed our, our culinary lives uh, with that move. Um, Tara and Sammy, you both traveled to Palestine several times together, but Tara, your first trip was without Sammy. In fact, we're really delighted that when you decided to join one of our food tours that we organized jointly with the Amos Trust, what were your impressions back then and how did they change over the various trips that you took? Oh, um, gosh, I don't think what year that was. I mean, it was such an incredible trip and it, you know these these trips are always so amazing because everyone's taken out of their lives and put with you know a completely sort of mixed bunch of people and then you'll share this very intense few days and and uh it's sort of unlike anything else I guess it's like sort of putting on a theatre production or something 
um, and this incredible access and privilege you have to go into people's houses and and um, and yeah, I mean, there was just a lot of a lot of traveling and talking and eyes being opened and eating and um, and I, mean, I think I think kind of years on, my impressions are quite similar in terms of just awe of the produce and how much people whose lives are sort of focused around it, sort of whether it's the calendar year or or the kind of the family way um, and how so much of the stuff we sort of try and uh, protect sort of you know, you know, in Southwest London about kind of batch cooking or cooking for the freezer or eating seasonally. You know, it's not a kind of, it's not a lifestyle choice there. It's just, it's just a way of life. And it was amazing for me to see, you know, we talk about kind of food and identity and I don't think I really realized at all what that meant in any way until I went to Palestine um, and actually saw the link between people and the olive tree and the harvest and the produce and the, and the olive oil that results and the chicken musakan dish that showcases the olive oil. You know, the people who've grown up kind of debating whether cream or jam goes on first on the scone, you know, don't, don't really give two hoots. And actually, I, I, I realized that something that we kind of bandy around, sort of food and identity, is, it's, it's just such a real massive thing. So that, that whole that whole link um, was completely new to me. And then that kind of remained with every, with every trip. Amazing. Um, how was it for you, Sammy? What was it like going back after such a long absence? I think you, were you, you didn't visit for about what, 17, 20, 20 years? 12, 12 years, I think. 12 years, okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I went back to um, a familiar kind of, um, uh, place that I, you know, I knew very well. Um, it was just for me, I, I was really anxious to go, but then the minute you step there, it's just kind of everything then kind of uh, vanish. And you just realize that, you know, you were born there, you know, you speak the language, you know, the people, you know what to expect. Uh, almost nothing really surprised me. Or I didn't, you know, when I um, went the previous year, um i've never seen the uh, separation wall so that was kind of um kind of um hard to kind of swallow I, especially because my sisters uh live kind of five minutes from each other and because of the wall now you have to spend 45 minutes traveling between them uh with two checkpoints and it's just um, hideous and also kind of uh, it it kind of brings you back to reality and to the whole problems and somehow you forget some of the stuff but then when you when you have to face it on a daily basis you kind of it drags you down and uh, i keep saying that it was very important uh, for me to have tara next to me on these trips because uh, um, the obvious thing that i saw for tara was all new and lots of questions kind of came by and uh, the first the first uh, trip that I did, I, I did my own with a family and people that I know. The second and the third trip that I did with Tara, we man, we also did friends, you know, people that kind of met became our friends and they helped us a lot to gap a lot of um, uh, the daily kind of running things from, you know, driving around to explain things to how how things works. Um, especially for Tara. Mm. And we were lucky that we were allowed to go on more than one trip. So, you know, the, the, these weren't people we kind of met for an afternoon and kind of got their story. They were people we had the, the ability to actually hang out with and spend time with and meet time and again. And, uh, yeah. and so, time, you know, time is the thing that I didn't realize when I was doing all my spreadsheets that Sammy was talking about, that actually time was the thing that was gonna be our big gift. But it's funny with time and what Sammy's talking about the wall. I always think about Vivian Sansor, who we profile in the book with the Palestinian um, uh, seed library. Um, and she, said, she, she used to say, if there was one thing I could sue the Israeli government for, it'd be just taking my time and like just taking it away from me. And just all this time queuing and that Sammy's sister spend 45 minutes traveling a distance that should take 10 minutes. And, you know, I think every time we sit in a traffic jam and we kind of, 
grind our teeth and yet yeah, sort of just someone taking away your time and again the flip side of that with food when I'm always awed by how much time people spent cooking for us <laughs> and it's it, it's not just the food it's just like wow you just spent all that time on us that's such a that's such a gift that you've given us yeah I agree I remember once someone saying if you just replace the word time with life because really life is time yeah it's then that kind of puts it in context like someone taking away your time they're taking away your yeah. some of your life and people yeah. giving you time is they're giving you some of the life which is so generous and wonderful and at least when they're cooking it's really worthwhile <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, but it, it was wonderful uh, to see that some of these people that you met they made such an impression on you and that you made profiles and short stories that just sort of told us a bit about the inspirational things that they're doing and your the profiles vary from people to places to projects that have inspired you um, some of you who've read the book would recognize some of those names like Vivian Sansour that Tara just mentioned and Khadr Khadr and Basama Barahme, who all visited the UK at some point over the past 10 years on a Zaytun Fair Trade Fortnite tour. Um, maybe you could tell us a bit more about one of those encounters that particularly moved you that was really memorable. Um, I mean, I keep talking about Islam in the uh, Ida refugee camp because I, I found her, I mean, it's quite astonishing the way she does things. And she's, uh, uh, first of all, I was just wanted to say that women in Palestine run run the, the business for everyone. <laughs> the, 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 the husbands normally is kind of come second. First, they're kind of push into the family and the kids and everything. And the husband kind of come after that. Um, but um, Islam is one of them. She, um, I mean, she wasn't born in the refugee camp and uh, but she ended up there because of her family. And uh, unfortunately she have a, a disabled kid and in the refugee camp, they didn't have um, a school for a disabled kid. So she started thinking, what, what can I do to, to help my kid? And she started cooking first. She was cooking for people. And then she started cooking with people. And she got well known that people from abroad used to come approach her and cook with her in her own kitchen. And she managed to get also other women from the camp to help her uh, with you know, the task. And a year later, they opened a school for disabled kids to help her kid and other kids in the in the um, camp. But also, um, um, this is this is, she find um, a, re, a kind of almost like an escape or relief from the kind of grim reality that they have into really hosting people and feeding people and cooking with people and managing to make money. The third, the sec, the second time we went to see her, she already built two floors on, on her house and she was hosting people for free uh, in Ramadan, you know, like uh, iftars and uh, given a lot of the food also to uh, needy people, people that didn't have money to, to, to afford it. And this is something that uh, uh, you feel kind of really humble and super inspired by people like this. And also she does it with a big smile on all the time. And she, you, you feel like this kind of almost like a fragile, but very, very strong personality and uh, ent entrepreneur. And uh, this, you know, people need to hear that. People need to read about people like Islam with it's all funny, the like, Sammy, Sammy green using background. The sorry. Sammy using the, the words. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. With all the back the grim background, she managed to do something really positive for herself, for her family and the community she lives with. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Um, I was just, I was interested because Sammy was using, he was using kind of contradictory words in the same sentence, like humble and strong and, or humble and inspiring and, and um, fragile and strong. And I think that really uh, touches on the fact that it was profiling people that allowed us to um, sort of encompass the paradox that you find in Palestine that against this grim backdrop, you do have so many stories of people who are really enterprising and who are just going about their business, trying to kind of make make their way. And 
And they would say, you know, we met people in refugee camp who said that people will come in and then be surprised that they've got a mobile phone or they're wearing their Nike trainers and, and you know, all these, and, you know, and, um, and so, yeah, we, we kind of, that, that's why we've got all these, these profiles because they just allow for all these contradictions because it is so grim and depressing. And also it's really delicious and inspiring. So these things are all, all true. And, and so often the reader or the, the news consumer is just fed sort of, not literally, but fed sort of one side and we wanted to give both. And also these profiles allowed us to show lives going on today because you know, there are lots of great cookbooks, but, but um, often they, they, can, they can be sort of slightly tinged in sepia if it's kind of stories of you know, grandmothers and grandmothers and grandmothers. And we very much, as well as wanting all the recipes to be really practical and useful for the home cook, outside Palestine, because that's our, that was our aim. Um, also to be very, very contemporary, like this is happening today and you can go to Palestine with this book and go and meet these people today. It's not kind of stories of he oldie, he sepia. Mm. How difficult was it to simplify some of these recipes, some of them very traditional, some of them traditionally cooked for 20 people? To simplify them and to you know bring them down to like something that's for four people or you know a normal UK family size. Yeah, um, it wasn't an easy task, and also um, uh, at the beginning we kind of decided that this is what we were to do. But also, uh, as we know, Palestinian food is really delicious, but you spend the time doing it, and then you end up with this kind of brown or beige thing on a plate or in a tray, and you think. Um, uh, people are not going to get that. I mean, it's actually, of, of course, it's delicious, but it doesn't look good. So we st I, we started um, borrowing some of the ingredients from the dish to kind of make it a little bit more prettier, garnish uh, with some of the ingredients in. But also, we knew that people are not, you know, there's quite a lot of uh, traditional Palestinian cookbooks now in the market, and people are don't always have the time well, at the moment they have a lot of time but uh, um, they don't have the time and you know we want people to come home after they work on a Wednesday and cook something delicious that takes only 20 to half an hour and this was always in our mind that you know we just want to kind of do something that um, quite traditional very loyal to the ingredients very loyal to the profile of the flavoring without losing you know the the whole kind of uh, Palestinian pantry, the, the, the key ingredients, the flavoring, and uh, but keep it also straightforward and simpler uh, with lots of tips. Tara got that from the beginning that you know what you can prepare ahead of time. And I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with I'm obsessed with cooking ahead and and batch cooking and um, but you know as Sammy said it, it wasn't a straightforward thing. We sort of it it took kind of two years to to do and every recipe was uh was tested many times um and also every recipe was put through this this kind of test of us wanting to move things forward and not not write the recipe we didn't want it to be full of recipes that are in other books or online because that's not the book we wanted to write um so we wanted to kind of move it forward but at the same time very aware that our sort of playing around in inverted commas uh, it's not just playing around for people to whom recipes are strongly linked to identity and history. Um, and if I was ever playing around too much, Sammy was very, very sort of strict with the fact that we were not going to have kind of X, Y, sort of Z quinoa, for example, if I mentioned that as a gluten-free alternative, you know, absolutely there's no quinoa in this book, although I do make the odd mention, we do make the odd mention, <laughs> slipped in under Sammy's radar. Um, but then things like ingredients, if, if, you know, if, if someone can't get kishik, you know, the kind of fermented disc of yogurt, we don't want it in the book because it makes the recipe alienating. So we'll offer alternatives if um, if they're there or we'll just sort of not have it. And uh, thanks to the large range of amazing Zytoon products, we can drizzle everything in olive oil and zatar and beautiful squidgy dates, like Bridget said. Yeah, I just want to add one more thing about um... Uh, kind of updating and making recipes much simpler that it actually talks to a lot of um, uh, young Palestinians because they see it as, ah, oh, this is something that I know I've 
taste it so many times. My mom cooks it all the time, but you do it a little bit differently. And it's actually quite cool to do that because first of all, I don't have to spend the amount of time that mom normally spends in the kitchen and I can do something that, you know, as delicious. So you're going to yeah. have lots of mums here across with you, Sammy, Palestinian mums. Yeah, something something like we've got this vine leaf pie. So instead of spending hours kind of rolling vine leaves, which is lovely if you've got a group of people and that's the occasion and it's the weekend and or it's a celebration. But if you want that on a Monday night, it's not so lovely to kind of roll sort of 80 little cigars. So we do it in a great big tray bake and you've got all the flavours, but it's, um you know, you cut it up like a lasagna. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing that, by the way. Like... <laughs> I will never roll vine leaves myself. My, 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 sister, my sister always say, you know, I spend half a day rolling these vine leaves and they go in five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then they just, <laughs> just go. <laughs> oh, exactly. Sometimes that's what you want. Sometimes you want to roll uh, 50 vine leaves, but, but oftentimes you don't. <laughs> it can be meditative, but yeah, you do need to find the time and the patience. In your book, you talk a lot about that link, you know, Tara, you alluded to that, the link to the land, the people, the food they eat. What did you observe, uh, Sami, that characterizes that strong link that people have? I mean, um, I come from a farmer, farmer's um, family and all, all around Palestine, I mean, you know, they, were all, they always had a lot of land or bigger plot of land and the connection to the farm farming and to the land it's not just metaphorically but also you know it's it's to do with the fact that uh, this is their way of living but also whatever they grow this is their um, uh, if, if it's olives for example it's you know to supply olive oil and olives to the family friends but also the they sell some of it and earn, you know, some money income from it. Um, but also, whatever they they grow in the, in their uh, land, they this is you know kind of related to the seasonality, to the pantry, to you know uh, uh, they didn't we, we didn't have supermarket in the back back in in the days. So people used to just sell each other or take them to the market and sell some of the stuff to you know uh, buy to be able to buy other things that they don't have like grains or uh, meat or uh, actually livestock as well which is uh, was kind of a part of the farming as well uh, so the connection to the land and farming and to the ingredients is very very strong and it's still very very strong uh, people still you know farm their lands and uh, you know you guys work with people in, in Palestine, farmers and dis, disputers, uh, where, you know, from frike to wheat to the zata to the olives and the, the uh, dates and the olive oil, of course, and the olives. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. And exactly. I think in, in, in the context of Palestine as well, apart from just that strong food heritage because of the political situation, uh, that link to the land becomes a lot about just existence and survival as well. Uh, how do I hold on to the land? How do I make sure it doesn't get confiscated? But also the land gives me food security. It gives me an income. So um, this brings me to, to the next question I have for you, Sami. Whether over the years, whether by being born Palestinian or the career that you've had, you've been in this meeting point of food and politics, whether you like it or not, and you've had some backlash because of it. Um, yeah. Is there a choice to stay out of politics when we talk about Palestinian food? I, I, I personally tend to stay kind of away from politics because it always kind of drag, drags you into this rabbit hole that, you know, you just don't know who's who and who's with what. And um, the, the last events that happened in Israel and Sheikh Jarrah and all that, I felt like I needed to talk because I needed to use my, my voice to, um, to I, I just felt like, you know, I'm so, so far away from, the, from what's happening, but I, I felt like I needed to do something. So I, I spoke up and uh, it brought quite a lot of um, uh, positive, but it brought also a lot of negative. And I was really, really surprised. I'm not surprised from the Israeli side, but from the Palestinian side. And I, I, I was just thinking uh, to uh, people that you can't even talk to, they wouldn't, they, they're not even willing to discuss. They attack you like you are the, the, the reason why 
Palestine and Israel are like this at the moment and what's happening in in Palestine in Jerusalem it's because of you and and these kind of pointing things that are and you can't really talk to these people but I think like thinking there are so many issues to 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 kind of uh, solve in 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 back home and we just pick on the little things that really kind of almost not worth it um, just because I have a, an Israeli partner and friend and we are successful, it doesn't mean that I'm less Palestinian or I'm a traitor or I can, I'm selling my, my, my identity and my, my, uh, my uh, land or Palestine. And it's just kind of really, really pity. And people need to um, somehow find perspective for things as well. The other thing I was thinking is a kind of, uh, these people have um, a platform and I think they need to find uh, a, a, a worthy corner to preach, uh, not to ha hang on, you know, a chef, two chefs that are kind of doing their best to make things better, but not just between them, but also the whole fact that I'm, I'm a Palestinian and Yotam is an Israeli. Um, it, sh it should be uh, something positive and not negative the way they see it. But also, Sammy, it's, it's, it's the worst side of social media, isn't it? It's just, it's people shouting down their, their telephones. And if, if, uh, if, if people actually sat and read Jerusalem and Palestine side by side, like I'd be surprised if there was quite so much shouting in both books. And I could only speak to Palestine as such an invitation to people to come to the table, not just hungry for food, but also hungry for for conversation and stories and and listening and and you know I, I really strongly believe that Palestine is just the opposite of Instagram. <laughs> yeah, and I, like you know, a guy that published a Palestinian cookbook talking about checkpoints and settlements and the separation wall and bloody read it. Just go out yeah. and buy the book or just borrow it and read it and then you know come and talk to me about what's happening there and this kind of hanger that everybody just hang their coat on is kind of come on mm, it is. Uh, and i was thinking also kind of in between myself i bet you they've never been to palestine palestine so they don't even know what's happening there no we had we had a um a funny moment in uh, in nazareth where we spent the whole evening with this guy and it just shows what what nonsense kind of gossip and rumor and you know stuff is compared to actually sitting around a table with someone so we spent this whole evening with this guy who ran a restaurant in Nazareth and he was very very opinionated everything was political food was politics he had very strong opinions about everyone and everything and yet we spent this really nice evening together and we kind of drunk when we were told to drink and eaten what we were told to eat and just been on kind of best behavior because he was slightly terrifying um and then at the end of the evening after three hours like hey 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 have you guys heard about this palestinian who went to london and sold out and set up shop with this israeli and sammy was like that's me <laughs> and it just shows just what a nonsense shouting is compared to what bridges can be built when you all sit around and it you know it sounds like a sort of cliche to say you know come to the table and yeah. eat and listen but it's it's true as we all know yeah, I mean, I guess it's exactly, it's not about hummus kumbaya, you know, like if we all have humpers together, the, the, the world problems will be solved, but more about what values people stand for. So some of our supporters are, are Israeli and we, you know, we work with some human rights organizations there that we really admire. So, yeah, from our experience, we, we found it quite challenging, as I'm sure you did, to sort of um, raise awareness about the unacceptable conditions within which people are trying to conduct their lives, but without constantly defining them by the occupation. What were some of the pressures you faced when writing this book when you wanted to sort of do justice to both of these narratives? Um. I mean, hanging around with people and hearing the story, first of all, and for me, it's uh, more personal because, you know, I come from there, but also it touches my family. You know, it's the struggle, like I mentioned before with my sisters, it's, uh, it's a daily kind of uh, struggle that they have to face on a daily basis. And you get to the point where 
I want to talk about it. I want people to hear about it. It's not just black and white. There's quite a lot of gray and, you know, this gray nobody talks about, you know, unless something happened to in Israel between, you know, the Palestinian and the, the Israeli uh, soldiers, nobody hears about it. I mean, a lot of the stories as well, you don't even hear. They don't come to the news in Europe or in the UK. And uh, um, I know people... Uh, uh, there's quite a lot of propaganda as well around and you know you hear all these stories and it's kind of it did happen or didn't happen it's like and you know you hear two two sides of the story and there's something that need to be in the middle that one thing but also they need to um people should talk because it's not it's not rosy there it's quite horrible actually and it's getting worse and worse and uh, the more you go there the, the more you feel like you need to kind of speak up and talk to, about it and talk to people about it and just i mean the, a book like palestine it's a good way to to get people to read about the place and also food connect people so they connect with 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 the place and the people in a different way and hopefully by by doing that they want to go and visit and uh, know about the place more and read more about it yeah and i i, so I, I, I think i think I think like Palestine medicine. is quite a, um, you know, as well as being this beautiful, delicious cookbook, which people are loving the recipes. I think, I think the uh, the amount of space given over to the stories told is quite bold, and they are all really, really different stories, um, and they are telling the reality of people's lives, which is indisputable fact. And in so doing, that's quite bold, and they're told without judgment and and um and they're and they're they're all very different from each other so those kind of sort of 11 12 windows um are it's, it's quite a sort of bold move i think in a cookbook definitely very very gutsy um i see you're working with waitrose and seeing the launch of their levantine range it looks like the appetite for eastern mediterranean food is unstoppable and now the awards you're winning, what do you think of this, the, the, the rise of the popularity of Palestinian cuisine and how this trend changes the preconceived notions people have about Palestine? I think uh, it's a wonderful thing it's happening. It's, um, it's, it's slow, but at least it's happening now. Um, I mean, uh, from a chef point of view, is, Israeli chef took a lot of credit for you know, Palestinian food. Uh, in the past, but now it's slowly, it's slowly changing and the ball kind of uh, bounced back. Hopefully it will continue like this. And also it's just ingredients, isn't it? So, you know, we, Sammy and I are obsessed by tahini and we're obsessed by zaitun olive oil and, and the proper zata. But still, every single day I meet people who um, are using kind of suppressor Greek tahini, which, with apologies to the Greek, uh, you know, is just going to kind of ruin your meal because it's so claggy and bitter. So there's, it's so exciting that the Waitrose, um, you know, and <laughs> many others are embracing um, the products because it just invites conversation. So still people are, I mean, just so many people are still waiting to discover the joys of Palestinian tahini and proper zata that has only got a few ingredients in it and and even like Palestinian olive oil some people don't even know that they can get it <laughs> so so um so yeah I think it, I think it's all still really to play for well thank you both so much for also highlighting the zaytun ingredients and and making um, them accessible to, to the public by, uh, by talking about them on Instagram and your platforms. So there's Waitrose, you've got CBS, you've got loads of interviews, podcasts and media. What is next for you both? World domination. I, sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm having a break, a bit of a break. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm working on a, on a book. Um, but uh, it's too early to talk about. And I'm doing quite a lot of bits. Um, I'm going to open also, I talked to you about it, maybe in a, a spice shop. So yeah, I'm busy. <laughs> Dara. Um, what's next for me is lunch, followed by... <laughs> <laughs> um, dinner. <laughs> <laughs> followed by dinner. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, there's always lots of things on. There were columns and, and books and um, working on a book at the moment with Helen Go, who wrote Sweet with Yotam and Yotam. Um, and then uh, I don't know if people have seen, there's a sort of new launch of OTK. So there's sort of a uh, new book coming out in a slightly different format. Um, so yeah, more words, more food, more eating. Brilliant, can't wait. So Palestine is Sami's love letter to Palestine and its people. This is my final question before we move to some Q&A because we've got lots of questions from people. Um, how was the book received back home, Sami? Home? Um... I mean, really well, I think by, again, younger uh, crowds. Uh, my family are super proud of it. Um, we Palestinians don't cook from cookbooks. <laughs> we, know, we know it by heart, you know, it's kind of, you, you inherit it from your mom or your grandma, so you kind of continue the, 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 the whole cooking thing. Um, but uh, it's been uh, around the world, Europe and America, it, it's really, really got uh, great reviews and been received really, really well. And it will continue to do so. I always uh, think it's amazing that, that Sammy was this little boy who was shooed out of the kitchen because boys weren't meant to be in the kitchen. And, and it was kind of, it was just not a, not a boy's work, not a man's work. And I just, I constantly am amazed by the fact that the book that is sort of teaching so many people how to cook Palestinian food at home is written by a man. It's really unusual because men are just not in the in the home kitchen in Palestine. Well done, Sammy. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, I'm going to move on to some Q&A now because we've got a few questions there. What is the most quintessential Palestinian dish for you? Um, sakhan. And sakhan, I think it's kind of a very, uh, a very Palestinian dish that um, uh, related again to the land, to the, the, the olive harvest, to the olive oil. And it's really, really simple dish, which is roasted chicken, spiced roasted chicken with this delicious uh, uh, flat bread called tabun that it's, um, they take it in the morning when they harvest the, the olives and they will sit around and you just assemble it while you're there. I mean, it's a flat bread with a lot of olive oil, the chicken, lots and lots of caramelized onion with sumac and some nuts on it. And they, they will just scoop it. You know, they just use their hand. There's, there's no pencil to, to eat oh. that or cookery, just I'm kind of tear it and eat it. And they serve it normally with a bit of yogurt or yogurt and cucumber or just a honey sauce. Yeah, it's such a nice entry point, isn't it? Because it's such a it's such an easy dish to make. And yeah, it really showcases um, so many ingredients. Yeah, I love that one. And I bet also on the other end, a, a dish that's very untraditional, but one that I absolutely love um, is this uh, this baby gem uh, lettuce, which has got this burnt aubergine yogurt and shatta. So it's it's not a traditional recipe, but uses shatta, which is this uh, fermented chili paste that Sammy and I are sort of obsessed by, and then the the burnt aubergine with the tahini. Um, and sort of, so so those two dishes sort of show what we're trying to do with the book. On one hand, quite tradi very traditional recipes, and then on the other ingredients that are familiar but then showed in a completely kind of new fresh fashion so that's that's also a delicious one when the sun is out mm, yum bring on lunch <laughs> <laughs> not that i want anything that i've got here at, at the moment i want that dish or i'm uh, one of the many things i love is that the book includes recipes from the whole of historic palestine are there any places that you would have liked to visit but weren't able to yeah that's uh... Gaza, we didn't we didn't manage to go because we were worried that they're gonna let us in and then we're gonna get stuck there. Um, because I think also there's quite a lot to discover there, and uh, their food is, is slightly different from the rest of Palestine, which you know a lot of chilies and a lot of dill and you know um, lots of seafood, um, very earthy kind of like Romania comes from there and uh, sumaki and uh, so. Unfortunately, I know I'm hoping in the future to go and visit and discover it. But yeah, it's a it's it was kind of sad for me not to go. Uh, we didn't go to Hebron because 
I just find the whole place is so depressing. I mean, it's so because I I have childhood memories. My 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 mom comes from Hebron, and um, I remember the old Hebron. I just didn't want to kind of face it again and see how they destroyed the whole city. Yeah, I'm talking about the Israelis here. Yeah, I can I can imagine. I've got a foodie question for you here. Garlic cloves should they be crushed, sliced, or chopped? And does it even matter? Uh, each recipe asks for different things. I mean, I I like to crush it with a garlic crusher, which looks like this, because I think this is a very good uh, thing to do with when you crush. Are you prepared the garlic. for this question, you get Not just the garlic, but also all the juices into the dish. Yeah, I do my. It's very <laughs> I don't have my prop ready to show you like Sammy and a slightly, <laughs> um, but I love to do it in a granite pestle and mortar and then, and then bash it up with, uh, with sea salt. Um, so that's always how I do it. And then I often tend to do more than I need. And then it just sort of sits around in a little pot for a couple of days and then it's just ready to go in dressings and everything. Yeah. My, my sisters do that as well. So they, 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 they pound their, their garlic mm. with, with a pinch of salt. I think that's that's traditionally how my my grandparents used to do it as well. Oh, yummy. On that delicious note, I'm going to start to bring this to a close as we're about to run out of time. So um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sammy and Tara. We would encourage you all to buy the book, um, cook the recipes. And if you're on social media, please post the pics and tag Zaytun and Sammy. I'm sure most of you have a copy of the book, but if you don't, then it's time to order it because Christmas is just around the corner. Sorry to depress you, but it's true. And this book is going to make someone's Christmas for sure. And while you're at it, you might as well stock up on quintessential Palestinian goodies. Uh, for that reason, we've put together a bundle of our products along with a copy of Palestine to make it easy for you to just have it all in one place. Okay. Aha, uh -huh, there it is. Um, what a present. That's just beautiful. It, it's a really good bundle. And yeah, I, I use all the products. And it's the best Palestinian olive oil, guys. And also, I mean, you need to add some caramel. I, I ate a whole packet of caramelized almonds last night. Thanks, Manol. Thanks for me. These, these just, uh, keep, they've just been them. freshly yeah. roasted as well. So Thank they are like God. a seasonal product. I was like, I'll just have one. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> yeah. And when it's safe to travel, we just want to tell everyone, we encourage you to visit Palestine, whether it's after a long absence, as in Sami's case, or a whole new eye-opening experience, as in Tara's, you will feel the incredible warmth of the people and be invited to their homes, where you will experience phenomenal hospitality. In my personal opinion, a trip to Palestine should be on everyone's bucket list. What you'll experience, hear, see, smell, and taste will make it a trip that you won't forget. So um, please keep your eyes peeled for when our trips will resume. Um, and I think Heather has posted a link in the chat. And with that, I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. Sammy, enjoy cooking the feast for your guests uh, on Sunday. Tara, enjoy lunch. <laughs> Good luck with all your incredible projects. And thanks again so much for joining us today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very thanks much for, for having us. <laughs> Thanks for having us. You can all unmute if you want to say hi or bye. <laughs> hi and bye. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You get the book. Thank you so much from New Zealand. Good night. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. I'm from New York City. Um, wow. Lovely to have you here. I'm Gosh, it's France. early in New York, New York to be talking about Msachan mm. and burnt aubergine. Why not? <laughs> I know. I mean, we're talking about Palestinian. Come on. It's like that's true. That's true. <laughs> These dishes that take seven hours to cook, they start early in the morning. <laughs> Pounding the garlic. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Well, Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.